Uh, I'm Nick Mariello. Uh, I work for the IC group. Um, I feel like Katrina did a good job of controlling us. But we work with uh, uh, with worker costs across the country in a typical uh, business consulting, business support role. We do a lot of market research and feasibility studies. We're also shifting more towards uh, trying to develop new co-ops, especially in the conversion space right now. But we also have a home care team where we specifically dedicated to helping grow uh, home care co-ops in the country, and that's the team I'm on. I've been on the team for about three years now. Um, I think this is going to be an exciting conversation for me, standing in the public day. Um, typically, I find myself presenting uh, on the last session of a conference. Uh, <laughs> and, and, I'm usually, and I'm usually doing that as part of it, which may not be exciting, but it's going to be good. So, uh, Let's just go quick through like the topics I'm going to talk about. Just going to do a bit summary of defining what we mean by the public pay market. Let's see if a good job of that. Um, we'll talk about what the actual market is. Uh, we'll find out you know, because of regulations, there's some very specific aspects of it that are very different than the private pay market. And then I'm going to work my way through how operating in the public pay market will affect your co-op financially, how it affect your operations, how there's like sales and marketing implications. The implications of being in that market. Uh, and then, you know, talking through once we've gone through all those different changes that might happen to your co-op if you're operating in that market, uh, you know, what are the challenges and opportunities, and how do you figure out how it's if it's feasible for your uh, organization? So, there's really when we talk about public pay in home care, for the most part, we mean Medicaid, really. But there are a few other smaller markets. Uh, there's local government funding and no cooperative care. Uh, came out of a, a county-based program. Um, the Veterans Affairs often uh, does reimbursements for home care services. Uh, Medicare right now really does only um, home health uh, in a uh, right, like post-acute setting, so it's a very small slice of the market that with Medicare Advantage coming. That might change to be determined though. Um, but for the most part, when you're looking to enter into the market, in the public pay, you're, you're talking about Medicaid, you're talking about your state's Medicaid program. So what do we mean by the market? Um, as Stephen shows in the slides, of, uh, the total long-term supports and services spending, so, but there's uh, some data on what the home health care market is. Uh, this is a 2017 data. So for example, so the public pay market, which is Medicare and Medicaid for home health. So this includes home health organizations, so the, the, the research on businesses that operate in um, sliced up by industry, the way it's done, they typically conflate personal care and home health. So this is not the best data, but I think it's a good illustration of how the market's segmented. Um, so, and the public pay is about half and half Medicare and Medicaid in the home health and personal care settings. Um, and then private pay is, is uh, less than a quarter of the market, uh, which is sliced up as about 10% out of pocket, 10% private insurance, and uh, another segment for other. But what we're looking at is that, that dark blue slice is where you're going to be looking at. And you can see that's bigger than the entire private pay market. So it's really important. Um, you know, it's a real opportunity for a lot more revenue out there. That's why people are in this room. That's why people are thinking about public pay, because there's a lot of dollars out there. There's a lot of clients out there in that market. The national, um, as of 2017, about $34 billion, um, specifically from Medicaid-funded home care. But as Stephen noted, in some ways, that's not really relevant, because it's a fragmented marketplace. What's really relevant is what's happening in your state. What are your state policies? What are your state funding? So when you are looking you know, to enter that market, you're bringing your co-op into the public pay market in your state, uh, looking at the national market might not be relevant. What's happening in your state? What are the regulations in your state? Uh, how is the money flowing in your state? Like, who are the decision makers in your state? So first thing we're talking about is the ever sort of frightening Medicaid reimbursement rate. Um, but they're, 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 we all know they're low, and, and that can be a challenge. What I want to work through here is a bit of the math, a bit of financial math, but I think it'd be helpful to illustrate what, the, what, what is the impact of, of these lower rates uh, on your public. How many more clients do you actually need to drive the same level of profit, right? So this is a data, the private pay data up there is from Home Care Pulse, the public pay data is from the Kaiser State Tax. Uh, so these are general national averages, just trying to illustrate the issue is probably going to be different, these rates. Uh, in your in your state, as opposed to what the national level is, um, but as you can see, there's a pretty dramatic difference. Uh, in the private pay market, you're looking at 24 or 25 dollars an hour uh, usually. 
uh, with higher gross margins, about 40%. In the public pay market, um, reimbursement rates, you know, somewhere around $20 an hour, $19 an hour, with the gross margin is closer to 30, 33%. Um, so like the key takeaway here is that, uh, you know, with this math, it's pretty simple. You're gonna need more clients to drive the same level of profit to cover the same amount of overhead. But I wanna talk through the real question though, is how many more clients, how many more hours do you actually need? So, in like what I call a favorable scenario, where uh, the, a public, uh, your, your public pay clients are driving the highest margin in the market, 33%, and the private pay clients um, are have the lowest rates. So this is like the most favorable comparison I can do for public pay reimbursement rates and private pay rates. Uh, and you look through that math, you see that in a private pay agency or private pay client, a gross margin of $9.50 an hour. In public pay, that would be $6.27. What does that mean? It's a 52% larger gross margin. That's a real big difference. That means for every client coming through the door, you're going to get, um, you know, whenever a private pay client will drive three dollars an hour more, which is a huge change. Now, in a less favorable scenario, it's, it's even more difficult with assuming that uh, the private pay margins are a little higher, the private pay rates are a little bit higher. It could be up to like a 73% larger gross margin. I'm not trying to scare you away from the public pay market. I'm trying to make sure that if you're going to enter that market, we enter it with open eyes and understand the implications of this, right? So if you're going to enter the public pay market, you're going to need to build 50% to 75% more hours to reach the same level of profit. Okay, so that's a pretty significant difference. Um, and there's a secondary challenge though, bringing in that many more clients means there's more administrative work too, right? You're gonna to have to be able to, to manage all that new volume. So what comes with this increased size? So increased operational complexity. Um, and then you have to build new partner relationships. Uh, doing marketing on a one-to-one -one approach, uh, it's gonna be more difficult because you really need to drive in bigger clients. So you're gonna be need to work with discharge planners and you need to work with larger referral partners to drive in that higher volume of clients. And you're gonna need a new sales and marketing approach. You're gonna need the same traditional sales and marketing techniques, but you're also gonna be able to have to talk uh, sort of build these one-to-one -one relationships with um, more institutional clients who can refer to you a large number of, of um, well, institutional partners who can refer to you a large number of clients. So um, why the increased operational complexity? Part of the size, uh, obviously, if you have more clients, you have to do more scheduling, more billing, that's more difficult, right? Um, but there's a lot of other things to consider in those scenarios. Uh, you're gonna need a larger working capital reserve. Frequently, um, reimbursement from public pay providers can take a longer uh, longer time frame. It may take 30 days, it may take 60 days. I know the VA, for example, can take a very long time. So you're gonna need to be able to float that. You can book the revenue now, but you might not get that cash until much later. So you need to prepare for that and have a working capital reserve because you might come up on a cash crunch. Uh, so that's a real challenge that public pay cops that we work with are facing right now um, from managed care organizations that um, are not functioning well and can't pay uh, in a timely fashion. So that's a real challenge, you need to be prepared for that. Um, the second thing to worry about with this increased operational complexity is there's, there's a loss of autonomy. Um, you know, there's uh, another player out there, the managed care organization, the state has a lot of power and control. I know, uh, for example, uh, cooperative care, who we worked with a few years ago noticed that their margins were decreasing. Their revenue, their hours were the same, their margins were decreasing. What was happening was their managed care organization was instead of booking their clients at four hour blocks uh, in a day, was, for example, uh, we booked them in two two hour blocks in the morning and afternoon. Mm -hmm. The travel costs went up. Mm -hmm. So that's a real, the margins started decreasing through no like, change they made internally. Um, so you know that's something you have to be aware of and prepared for, is that um, there's another player in your operations that's not you, that you don't have control of. So that's a real challenge to be prepared for. Uh, as I said before, if you're gonna increase volume, that might mean more administrative work. You might have to hire someone else to deal with the new flow of clients. And then of course, uh, it's a highly regulated marketplace. You need time and there's cost uh, related to regulatory compliance. Now, in terms of sales and marketing, uh, I talked about this a bit earlier. Uh, you're gonna need to develop new partner relationships and need new sales and marketing approach. Um, so the larger referral partners to drive more volume. Um, you really have to build those relationships over time. Those are short-term relationships, those are long-term partnership relationships. 
uh, the developers, the discharge planners. Um, you're going to have, as Stephen pointed out, managed care organizations are becoming a larger and larger part of the market. If you're in a managed care state, your conduit to your clients is going to be through the managed care organizations that you work with. And you need to develop strong relationships with them. You might need to be in situations where you have a good enough relationship with them where you can renegotiate reimbursement rates with them. You can talk about the challenge I talked about in cooperative care and go to them, look, the way you're booking our clients makes it non-viable for us. How can we change this um, to make our operations more reasonable so we can serve the clients that they're obligated to serve, right? So they are also obligated to serve those clients. So there is power on both sides of the relationship. You have to understand that. Um, and sales and marketing basics are still really important. CHCA talked about this earlier. Their managed care organizations expect them to bring clients to them, right? That's basic sales and marketing. You have to go out there and market to those clients. You can't just sit back and wait for a managed care organization to bring the clients to you. So you have to be able to you know, do the uh, sort of the discharge planner relationships, the managed care relationships. You have to be able to also reach out to clients, uh, understand their needs, and be able to market to them. So, talked a lot about these implications, but so there's really, and I know I just made it sound really challenging because it is, but it's also a lot of opportunities there. Um, I talked about the challenges. The margins are lower. You're gonna need higher volume. Um, there's real policy risk too. Um, if your state changes Medicaid policy, changes the public pay policy, your whole market can change. One decision, one law passed overnight. So that's something you need to be really prepared for. Another real issue is revenue concentration. Back to what CHCA talked about, ICS, their managed care provider, went out of business. So a huge segment of their clients, all of a sudden, were shifting to another managed care provider. It's a real challenge. Um, you have to be very aware of that, that you have these big uh, partnership relationships that are bringing you a lot of clients, but if something happens with them, all of a sudden, you're gonna lose out on a large segment of your clients. So that's something to be pre prepared for. Uh, you need to try as much as possible to diversify revenue, so that's a real challenge. And there's higher barriers to entry. You need to be larger, so that takes more funding to uh, get to that size. Uh, the, regula the regulation compliance is a real challenge, uh, both in terms of building knowledge, building experience, time, and, and there's real cost to those. But it's a much larger market, as we talked about, the Medicaid market is larger than the entire private pay market. It's a real opportunity. Um, in a lot of ways, there's fewer competitors out there. Uh, the franchises aren't in this market, right? Yeah. The uh, private equity organizations that are going out there and buying up and consolidating independent agencies out there, they're not competing in the private pay market either. There's a lot of investment going into home care in, in the business world, but most of that is going into the private pay market. So if you can get into the Medicaid market because it's highly regulated, it also means there will be fewer competitors out there. Um, as we talked about uh, all, all week, Home care costs are mission-driven organizations in a way, they're community-based organizations. Uh, serving a Medicaid population is a real social impact. Uh, that might not be part of the business model per se, but it's part of who we are as cooperatives, so that's a real opportunity. Uh, the changes in Medicare Advantage might be a real opportunity and expansion of the public of the public pay market uh, to be ready for. Uh, as we talked about, it's a real opportunity to scale the home care cost sector if we can get into the Medicaid market. And then private pay clients, I know that looks like a mistake, but as we've talked about this week, private pay, many private pay clients will eventually become public pay clients. Mm -hmm. With the real cost of care, it's really expensive. Over time, uh, people will end up spending down their assets and they'll be eligible for public pay. So if you can operate in both spaces, they don't have to change providers. They get to stay with the same providers. That's a real opportunity. Too. So, how do you enter this market? Um, and talk about, you do a lot of research beforehand. Because every state is different, it's, I can't give you a one recommendation right now because it depends on your local state. So you have to go out there and research your state's regulation and licensing uh, or requirements just to be in the marketplace and figure out what that is. I know some states have done a little research in Washington state. You have to be in operation for three years before you can enter the public. Uh, so you need to understand what the barriers are in your local area to be able to do that. Uh, look at your local, your state or local government department of human services website, uh, long-term sports and services website. Try to understand your regulations. Reach out to their contact person on their website. Maybe try to have a conversation with them so you get a better understanding of what's going on. 
Um, understand what your state's Medicaid reimbursement process is. We're seeing a real change from fee for service to managed care. So you need to understand, are you in a managed care state or are you not? That really changes how you're gonna operate. And then go out there and research your state's uh, reimbursement rates. In general, you can talk to the same person at your Department of Human Services, you can go to a website like Kaiser State Facts and get a sense of what your reimbursement rates will be uh, if you enter this market. So, I see a little more math, a little more hypothetical math, um, but I think next to the research, there's also gonna be some analysis from that research to really understand what you need to do. So understanding what is the cost of, of how many hours, how much do those hours cost just to uh, become regulated, become part of the public pay market. What is the cost of ongoing compliance? And what might be the cost of hiring someone new uh, in your administrative part of your co-op to handle all this new flow of clients? You need to understand that cost. And then figure out what your public pay margin might be. If your state's reimbursement rate is, you know, figure out it's about $20 an hour, you can figure out that your margin is about 30%. So you're looking at about $6 an hour. It's not a rough estimate, it will be exact, but it'll give you a good sense of how big you need to do. And from there, you can estimate the number of new client hours you need to, to cover your projected cost increases. So using just a hypothetical, say you figured out the cost of entering the market at $60,000, and you figure your public pay margin is about $6 an hour, well, you're gonna need to bring up 10,000 new client hours you need to cover your costs, you know? So we have to figure out, is that viable? How long will it take you to, to get there? Um, and it really depends. I, this is obviously a hypothetical, but I think this process is really helpful in understanding, do we want to enter this market? How complicated is it to enter this market? How much is it going to cost us to enter this market? And what's the benefit too? If you think, well, we can add in 20,000 new client hours because there's all these Medicaid clients in our area, they're not being served, we enter the market, we're going to be able to do that, then it makes total sense. But you need to do just a little bit of math first to make sure you're making an informed decision. So finally, there's a few other considerations we want to talk about. Um, to think about. There's a growth in, in independent providers, uh, state administered independent provider programs uh, going going on right now. So that's something to think about. It's kind of, they're kind of competitors in a way. Uh, they're competing for clients and caregivers, right? Caregivers say, "Well, I can work for you." Or I can work for this, or I can work you know, directly with a client. You are funded by the state, and I don't have to worry about that. But there's a lot of value. You ever have to think through what do we provide as a co-op to clients and caregivers that isn't there in an independent provider re uh, relationship? Do we provide benefits? Do we provide training? Do we provide support uh, for a caregiver that's in an independent provider relationship? What happens when their client has to go into a facility or they lose that client? So if the agency can show to the caregivers out there that well, we're gonna keep you on and you're gonna get another client. That's a real value over the long term. Um, as I talked about earlier, Medicare Advantage is happening. It's something just to be in tune with, knowing that the market's changing, knowing that Medicare dollars might be able to go to long-term support and services, and be prepared for that. Because if you're in the public pay market, your competitors are preparing for that right now, right? So you need to be prepared for that too, before it happens, not after it happens. Uh, as Stephen talked about, these rising minimum wages are a challenge because the reimbursement rates are going up at the same time. It's going to squeeze your margins. So that's something you really prepare for. If you're going to enter the market in your state and you know that there's scheduled minimum wage increases, you need to be prepared to know that next year our margins are going to shrink and you can prepare for that. And finally, I just want to know this is a real big opportunity to scale the home care cooperative sector. It's such a big market. You need to understand this market. Uh, you need to be prepared. To, if you're going to enter this market, do it in a smart, informed way. There's a real opportunity there. Uh, I really think, as I said before, home care co-ops are community-based organizations. And these are uh, members of your community who really need these services. And it's really important that home care cooperatives can, can sit in that space. From a social impact perspective, I think it's really important. But then also from a business perspective. Um, if you want to be a $5 million organization, and right now you're a $700,000 a year organization, you're probably going to need to be operating in that public pay market. It's really where those dollars are. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for me or Steve?
really fun fast. <laughs> Um, some states limit both the state plan, personal carry service, and also the waiver. Uh, they're limited by CMS how many people they can have in the waiver program. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I mean, how will that impact them? You know, for example, Maryland, in their waiver program, they have a wait list of 10,000 people waiting for the waiver, oh, maybe more, I had lost count, uh, <laughs> waiting for the waiver program. So. Is that something you would have to take into consideration? Like, for example, the District of Columbia only allows 5,000 beneficiaries to be under the EPD waiver, the elderly and those with physical dis uh, anyway, disability waiver program. So I'm just, that's something I'm wondering if you need to be cognizant about. Yeah. Um, so I think the waiting list issue, why is something like, 770,000 people. Wait. Wait. Uh, I think two thirds or three quarters of them are people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And for the rest of those, those folks, older adults and people with disabilities, it's largely in five states. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but Texas, Florida, Maryland are right up there, right? So I mean, that does sort of limit the market in some ways. But I think even in those states, there's a lot of intention to eliminate waiting lists. Every state that has these monstrously long waiting lists, I think the, the mean wait time is 30 months to get services. Wow. Right. So you're just going without. It's, it's, it's sort of like a, it's a humanitarian catastrophe. Right? And states are aware of that. Wisconsin, in their rollout of managed care across the state, Part of the reason why they did it is to eliminate their lengthy waiting lists. And they did it intentionally over time. Um, so I think that we can expect in those states that have those really lengthy waiting lists, uh, that over time we're going to see those services expand, waiting lists go down. I mean, I, really, I think that in every state, we can expect the Medicaid funded space to grow, even if there are limitations, as you've noted, right now. I guess I always definitely, when I think of it, we're a private pay company where I work in Washington, and we definitely, as an organization, want to take on Medicaid clients. You know, it's something that's in our future, but I know in conversations with our board and membership, kind of that autonomy question is really a big one when you're talking about taking on Medicaid. You know, we finally reached a profit point um, where we're able to talk about raising our wages, which immediately with the Washington reimbursement state, if we were to transfer to that, I mean, I imagine that we would have to have some cushion or capital to subsidize the wages. You know, I'm just wondering, like, how, as a worker-owned cooperative, could we approach Medicaid to try to prepare to retain some of that autonomy? Because, you know, being able to access profits to offer higher wages or, you know, different incentives that the caregivers of the organization own is a huge part of why people work here, you know? So, like, I, that's something that we're talking about a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's a real challenge. I think, um, I know capital's been in operation for a year, year and a half? Year and a half. Yeah, so I think organizational stability, financial stability should, would come first. You know, being able to develop, build up some reserves, build up some size, build up your, your internal operations before you enter this market, uh, I think makes a lot of sense to a certain extent. I mean, this is organizational, this is a board, you know, strategy decision, do you use, do you make the decision as a trade-off to subsidize, effectively use your margin and private bank clients to subsidize what's happening in your public bank clients? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And you have to do the math on that to figure that out. I think if the real, but the really having your internal operations in a good spot is really important because you're gonna need to just have more clients in the Medicaid space to drive the same amount of gross margin. So you need to be able to do that really efficiently, right? You, if you have a really laborious scheduling process, that's not gonna scale up, right? If you're gonna have you know, a, a billing process that doesn't work, that's not gonna scale up. So those really important internal systems need to be in place first, I think, before you can enter that scale up phase. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Yep. I think the uh, public pay, data that you had up there, is that from 2017? 
the uh, the mm -hmm. chart, the dotted yeah, chart. Yeah, the average. You have the average. Yes, the that's data. from Kaiser State Facts. It's all. It's not perfect data. It doesn't include some states. This 2017. Yeah, I believe okay. so. Yeah. Because I, I, I know that the um, actually the reimbursement rate in Washington is like twenty seven dollars an hour now. It's more north right. than wow. what you guys are charging for an hour. Mm -hmm. And then also, I just wanted to say Washington. Washington, the same, yeah, the same, same. Washington State, um, we just created this long-term care trust mm -hmm. where uh, 58 cents out of every $100 that we make um, will go to this trust, which will, it'll be a, a, li a one-time lifetime benefit of like $100 a day with a $36,000 cap. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, it's a great model that right. uh, we hope will expand that in some other states. Yeah, absolutely. I see that Washington's a like, great opportunity to enter the public pay market because you have, you know, a favorable legislature, you have a strong local union that's really pushed a lot of these things forward, so that's really an advantage. And that's why I say about, like, you have to look at your local state. To be honest, some states, I would say don't do it. <laughs> like it's the reimbursement rate's way too low. It's crazy if the state legislature is, is not doing their duty to meet their citizens' needs and they haven't really changed their mindset that it's family caregiving and that it's not a profession and they haven't updated that. Um, and that's a real opportunity to, I think to, to advocate as a co-op, but I think it might not be, I would not advocate through your business model, I would say. Esther. Uh, is there any uh, state-by-state state resource guide or outline of the presentations or, you know, like, do you have that in your like, or like, 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 our training standards research might be a good place to start because we're often drawing training standards or training requirements from the same set of regs under each waiver program, under licensure requirements, and for private pay agencies, et cetera. So that might be a good place to start. Um, but it's often really complex, and, and the regulatory language isn't always clear, and what's happening in practice is not always what's in the regs, right? So I think that even that might be a good place to start, uh, just to start exploring this, but still talking to your specific state is probably the best route to figure out what's happening. Yeah, um, my question is, how long does it take for Medicaid to like update the rate? Is it like every time minimum wage increase better? <laughs> <laughs> is, is anyone from Wisconsin in the room? <laughs> Can anyone give me the exact number of years that the fee to service rate was at 1608 per hour? Is it eight years? Eight to ten years that we did that 1608 per hour. So, so again, speaking to the next point, this is one of those areas where it's going to be so specific to your state because some states will do like a more frequent rebase. And then also, rebasing, that's also something you need to advocate on. Um, Arizona, their provider, uh, their providers weren't super organized around this issue, but once minimum wage happened, they realized that they really needed to focus on this. And actually, when they when they sort of backed out of the formula that the state was using to set rates, they realized the wage component was lower than minimum wage, right? So it wasn't even accounting for the right rate wage level. So these are all sorts of things that you need to pay attention to in concert with the wider provider community. Um, one of the things that the District of Columbia faced with is the issue of budget neutrality, which means that the money they spend on a waiver client for clients can't be more than what they spend on a nursing home client. Now and I'm probably not explaining it because I can't. It's really a weird. Uh, so I'm wondering if there are other states that are also in the have that particular. We're about a million dollars over what the budget should be for home and community-based services as compared to nursing home. And just to clarify, do you think that that's, is that related to the living wage requirement in 
the district or is it more uh, about like hours authorizations? No. Well, uh, I, I can't say that for sure. So I can't think of a, whether, no, I think not. I think, I, I don't know the specifics of the regulations, but I think cost neutrality is sort of baked into waiver programs in general. So part of the deal in making home and community-based services available to states is they couldn't be spending more than it would cost to deliver services in, in, in an institutional setting. I think in most states, including the district, I don't, I don't think that they're quite as close to that limit as, as you all are for, I'm not sure, probably endogenous reasons, but um, you know, I think it's 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 something to pay attention to. Certainly, in the policy arena, right? If you're thinking about rate right. setting, that it, you can't you can't really go over that limit. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, PHI. I mean, it's a really crazy guideline regulation that they want more. You know, that they're going to push people into a nursing home because of that. Right, that because it's more affordable than home. So I was wondering if there's any advocacy on the federal level as well in terms of those uh, kind of it's an old regulation i mean it's yeah i think we should chat offline because i'm not really i'm not really sure how other states stack up against the institutional oh, okay. level of costs yes um, what is, uh, uh, what is the federal agency that's in charge of the medicaid you might yeah. It's, it's CMS, which confusingly stands for the Centers for Weapons for Medicaid and Medicare, Medicare Services. Yeah. So it's CMS, but there are actually two ends. Medicaid and Medicare. <laughs> yeah. Are there any resources that have dealt with and I mean, certainly there's, there's the Olmstead case, which is largely about delivering, states have an obligation to deliver services in integrated setting possible, right? So this is, Olmstead was sort of the driving force behind a lot of the expansion in home community-based services. And again, it's sort of like these policy changes in court cases uh, are all tied up in a broader uh, advocacy strategy among people with disabilities. So I think that it all sort of like rolled out like, like contemporaneously. Yeah, I just was wondering for states that are now in long-term managed care, um, you know, structures, does rebasing have the same effect, or do they are we like in, is Medicaid even gonna like like if, if from if from my understanding, if they do rebase and we do see more um, coverage, it's not fee for service coverage. It goes to long-term managed care, and they decide. Um, that we're doing a really good job squeezing the system and getting the best care, and they just keep the. Yeah, I, you know, I think that it's it's different. Arizona, the example I keep mentioning, is a managed long-term care state, state. So somehow the rates, they're using some sort of rate formulary to uh, that somehow feeds into the per member per month that managed care plans are receiving not totally clear on how all that shakes out, but you're right that in a managed care state, it's less about uh, uh, sort of like the rebasing process and more about negotiating with your specific plans around the services that you're rendering, right? So it's it's really about making the case to the plan, but also to the state. And there are other, there are other states that have managed long-term care that will do things like wage pass-throughs and, and reimbursement increases that are really targeted at workforce challenges um, so I, I think in those states it's sort of like it's a little of both. Yeah. So, Margaret. Could you talk a little bit more generally? What is the Medicare Advantage program? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Medicare Advantage is essentially like managed Medicaid, mm -hmm. but in the Medicare program. So this was um, I don't remember which part. It's like clearly I'm a very Medicaid-minded person. Mm -hmm. That's why I think that's what both of us took a step back. But uh, basically, Medicare Advantage plans now have much wider flexibility in the services that they can cover, including non-medical home care services. Yes, yeah. The challenge in this space is that Medicare Advantage, uh, they're really sort of like uh, acute care-minded. Right, so that this is not a space that they have a lot of experience in. You're seeing some of these private plans kind of like dipping their toes in the water 
authorizing really like 20 hours a year or something like that. Sort of like these teeny little bits of uh, more family caregiver support and respite than a real long-term care strategy. But the difference is, and this is, a, this is a characteristic shared by some managed care plans, and most managed care plans, is they're paying for both long-term and acute care. So they're looking for a turnkey organization that can say, our long-term services and supports are so good that we're going to prevent hospitalizations, prevent ER usage, and save you money on the acute care side. So there's this broader trend both in Medicare and Medicaid towards integration of payment across both and looking to the future as these plans start to experiment more with this. We can, we'll probably see the ball start rolling on that. And uh, Nick mentioned that uh, you know, we want to be ready for Medicare Advantage. One way we can be ready for Medicare Advantage is by demonstrating in tangible ways that our services are keeping people at home and out of hospitals, and they're saving money for the system widely. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you or anyone in the room um, has given thought to, and if so, could speak to the potential implications for a single payer system on the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Does it make it easier to navigate this stuff? Is it harder? Like, would I mean, I, I think that some of the single payer systems do account for long term care, including them as a benefit. I, I don't foresee that being included in whatever, like, whatever happens in the future. I think we're a long ways off from that. Um, the system in Washington is probably the closest state level example we have of like a universal long term care benefit. The way they've structured it is it's basically like you get a cash benefit that you can use to manage your own services. Um, but there's a wider trend in this field to sort of expand the social safety net because it doesn't exist. I mean, I don't know what we're expanding. Right? <laughs> Medicaid is already inadequate, but creating a new long-term social, safe, social safety net. And uh, part of that is going to be, you know, how do we figure out how payments are structured? How do these systems uh, work in conjunction with existing systems and how are they integrated? I mean, these are all really key questions that haven't been answered yet. Great, well thank you so much everyone and uh, we'll be floating around for a little bit. And